from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. And this is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. A tech earnings season in full swing. Snap tumbling as much as 28% in late trading, saying Apple's new restrictions on data collection is hitting ads hard. And Intel falling about 6% on a lackluster forecast. And earnings roundup is just ahead. Plus, second time's a charm. WeWork finally makes its public market debut after near disaster in 2019. New leadership and a pandemic has changed the company dramatically. But one thing has stayed the same. WeWork is still losing money. We'll dive into its SPAC debut. And it's been 20 years since the iPod, the device that ignited a wave of Apple innovation. The inventor of the iPod, Tony Fidel, will join us here live to talk about Apple today and what he thinks the next big thing could be. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets. U.S. stocks rising to an all-time high in the seventh day of gains. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta standing by to tell us why. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, green on the screen for the S&P 500, closing at record highs. Really important to note, though, what took it forward. It was once again big tech under the hood, a little bit defensive positioning today. And you can really see that bolstered by the idea that some of those riskier gauges, your Chinese ADRs, which are seen as that riskier trade, or even uh, the Bloomberg Galaxy crypto index down on the day. So once again, that cross asset or that cross asset trade was defensive, not just in the stock market. It was in the bond market too. The bond market though is something that I want to pay attention to. And I'll bring it back to the tech show in a second, but really showing you this chart on my terminal here that where you do start to see one of the biggest highlights of today, which is, of course, five-year break-evens, pricing in more and more inflation, once again hitting a 16-year high. Emily, this matters for tech because the question is, do you start to use tech as an inflation hedge or do you start to pull out of those growth year stocks because of the effect that those higher yields, those higher rates might have on the, on the company? Something to keep in mind in the days ahead. But really, let's get to the newsiest event after hours, and that is, of course, that earnings wrap-up. Let's start with Intel because that is plunging about 7% after hours after the company trimmed its fourth quarter outlook. Emily, this is a huge deal because we know that the CEO, Pat Gelsinger, is trying to revamp the company right now. But at what cost? Is it hitting profitability? That's the concern that's weighing on the stock after hours. And of course, we have to hit Snapchat in just eight minutes after reporting uh, its fourth quarter earnings, a weaker fourth quarter, or I should say third quarter, but a weaker fourth quarter forecast, losing a quarter of its value. Now, this has everything to do with the Apple's new data collection restriction. So they're kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage, but they're also dealing with advertisers not so interested in Snapchat's business model because they're also dealing with supply chain concerns and therefore may not want to be getting new customers. A lot going on for both Intel and Snapchat. All right, Kriti Gupta, thank you for that roundup. I want to stick with Intel and bring in our Ian King to expand on what's happening there. Ian, shares falling, obviously forecast. Not what analysts had expected. What are the headline takeaways here? Yeah, I mean, Intel is going to say, look, hey, there's shortages across the industry. That means not enough PCs are getting made. And that's, so it's not our fault. That's what's hurting us. And that's kind of consistent with what other companies are saying. But if you look behind the numbers and you look at what you know investors are really concerned about here, they're like, look, how much of this is the market and how much of this is you losing market share? And the concern there is they're losing market share and their efforts to get that market share back and be more competitive are costing it in terms of profitability. So when do we think Gelsinger, the fruit of the efforts that he's making now, the investments he's making in manufacturing are, are actually start to be seen? You know, yeah. is it just going to take a long time, a longer time than analysts had expected to see the benefits? And that's an excellent question. And if you look at the numbers compared to where they were a, a year ago, they're down like six and a half percentage points in profitability for a manufacturing company. That's really indicative that you are struggling either with competitiveness or your costs. Um, and, and this is, you know, the abiding concern is to make a new chip plant 18 months to, to design new products, probably as long. So anything that Gelsinger did on day one in February, he worked, you know, when he walked through the door, won't materialize until at least next year. And then it's got to, you know, take some, you know, foothold in the market. So no short, no easy solution here is, I think, the concern. Gelsinger saying they're still in the early stages of the journey, though he still sees enormous opportunity ahead. I guess the question is how much market share is lost while Intel is making this transition? 
Yeah, I mean, this is where Intel reports, and then a week later, AMD reports. Intel will come out and say it's this, that, and the other. And then, you know, if AMD comes out like it has done for the last four or five quarters and shows, you know, tremendous growth, the conclusions are there to be drawn, and they're pretty ugly ones for Intel. Ian, you've been covering this business for 20 years, the chip business in particular. From, from your perspective, is the bet on the foundry business, is that a good bet? I mean, all I can say is they've tried it before and it didn't work. This time, Gelsing is saying, look, we're serious, we're going to put a lot of money behind it, we're going to do it. But, you know, the price and the length of time, it, you know, the inertia that exists in this business to, to, to go from zero to, you know, to leadership, it's taken TSMC as long as I've been covering the company, this industry to get there. So it's possible, of course it's possible. Intel is a tremendously powerful company with loads and loads of resources, but it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna happen overnight if it ever does. All right, Ian King, I'm gonna let you get back to reporting on those results and listening into the call. I will be speaking with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger Friday. You can catch that interview, 1.30 p.m. Wall Street time, 10.30 a.m. here on the West Coast. We'll be putting all of these questions to Pat himself. And sticking with earnings, I want to touch now on Snap. Shares tumbling as much as 28% in late trading on concerns about the company's ad business since Apple's software update limited targeted advertising. Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners with us now. Rohit, what's your take? What's happening with Snap here? This is after a pretty buoyant quarter last quarter. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, all of us as in on the on the investment community, we thought that uh, there is going to be headwinds across the board from Apple. There are going to be headwinds uh, due to engagement from COVID comps and also probably a little bit of headwinds from uh, kind of supply chain and other macro issues. So all these three headwinds, I think they have just amplified as the quarter has progressed. And uh, I think the big question here is uh, this reaction to Snap. Is this because it's because of Snap or is this because of the entire industry. We will know more as Facebook and other companies report next week. But as of right now, this uh, feels to me that this is not just Snap standing alone on an island. It is across the industry. So um, this reaction feels to be a bit too severe. And of course, other companies like Facebook have indicated they're going to be feeling the same pain as well. Facebook, however, is facing a slew of negative press. And I wonder how much of Facebook's pain could be Snap's gain. Um, I feel in the near term, Snap has uh, gained at the cost of Facebook over the near term. Over the longer term, uh, probably it all settles out. But uh, what we have seen over the last probably six months, Snap has gained at the cost of uh, Facebook, Instagram, given uh, some of the other issues that Facebook is dealing with. Um, also, Snap has been executing and innovating at a pace that we haven't seen from other companies. Augmented reality, social commerce, uh, their lenses, uh, various different innovations. I think uh, Snap is well positioned for next year. So far, what I see from this earnings, this reaction feels a bit overblown. We'll know more mm -hmm. as the next day's progress. Okay, uh, Evan Spiegel at the Wall Street Journal conference earlier this week threw some shade at Mark Zuckerberg's vision for the metaverse. Spiegel saying he thinks the metaverse is dysto dystopian and talking about how all of Snap's AR efforts, he would argue, are trying to connect people more to the real world, not trying to send them into a virtual world. What do you make of those two visions and how they're at odds and who's making the better bet? Uh Hard to know near term. Again, uh, what I feel is the way the new content is being consumed and being created using augmented reality, uh, that's the way both companies are going to succeed over the longer term. There is, uh, there is, a, there is a media uh, kind of pitch here that uh, Evan Spiegel is making, which feels more interesting, more realistic. We are yet to see what uh, Facebook's metaverse would look like and what the vision is going to look like over the longer term, although Facebook seems to be planning to spend a lot more uh, in the next, call it, 6, 9, 12 months. Right now, Snap is uh, being a little bit more realistic in this kind of, no pun intended, in this augmented reality world. Meantime, I know you're following our Bloomberg scoop that PayPal has explored buying Pinterest. Do you like this tie-up or not? It, it feels like a blast from the past. PayPal seems like it's missing eBay. Um, on a serious note, I think uh, uh, Pinterest is a very unique asset, Emily. It, is, uh, it, it uh, has the staying power that some of the other social media platforms don't have. They have the social and commerce element tied up very nicely, and they're very early from a monetization standpoint. So uh, over the next 
several years, probably PayPal needs uh, Pinterest more than what Pinterest needs PayPal right now. Who's got the better handle on social commerce at this point? Is it Pinterest or is it someone else? Is it Instagram? Uh, so far, I think Instagram, with all the various uh, shopping elements that they have uh, put in place over the last nine months, seems to be having a better handle. Uh, they are still very early. Overall, social commerce as a value proposition seems to be evolving. How that uh, becomes, whether we, they're going to build an Amazon inside, inside Instagram, we, we don't know that yet, whether they can uh, even sell that. So uh, Instagram seems to have the edge, but Pinterest has the, the core value proposition and intent where people are going to Pinterest with uh, an idea to buy something, to find something uh, that could be inspirational shopping as such. All right, Rohit Kulkarni, thank you so much. NKM, appreciate your insight there. We're gonna have a lot more uh, coming up with tech earnings next week, including most of the fangs, plus a whole lot more. On Monday, we're gonna get results from Facebook. Tuesday, it's Alphabet, Microsoft, Twitter, Texas Instruments, and AMD. eBay Wednesday and Thursday, we've got reports coming in from Apple, Amazon, and Pinterest. Of course, we're gonna bring you all the details right here on Bloomberg Television. Coming up, back to WeWork. Shares of the company that tried to go public back in 2019 spike after finally hitting the New York Stock Exchange via SPAC. We're going to bring you all the details on that one next. This is Bloomberg. One of the first things we teach our members is uh, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. Your investors gave you money. It's your job not only to build a long-lasting, meaningful company, but also make them a tremendous return. We're doing quite a good job at that and are planning to keep doing that. That was WeWork founder Adam Newman in a trip into the Wayback Machine, May of 2015. And while he is no longer with the company, he's still walking away with a pretty penny, a $2.3 billion fortune to be exact. And it wasn't just a good day for the founder, it was a good day for the company and employees too. The stock popped as trading began, shares opening at $11.28. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt, who covers WeWork for us and has meticulously documented its tumultuous journey to now. Ellen, how does the WeWork that went public today compare to the WeWork before the drama a couple of years ago? Well, it's been two years of a lot of tumultuous change for WeWork. They obviously lost their founder CEO, Adam Newman. Thousands of employees lost their jobs. This was in late 2019. The IPO that they originally wanted to do that year completely failed. They had to get um, bailout funding from SoftBank. Now, fast forward two years, they're trying to do it again. And things are pretty different. They have a different CEO. Um, the company's much smaller. They have decided you know, to cut off many of the side businesses and investments that Adam Newman made that made a lot of onlookers kind of scratch their heads. So the company is kind of repositioning itself as like leaner, more serious, much more sober, um, you know, definitely like very far away as much as possible from the Adam Newman chaos spiral of 2019. Um, and also they've been through COVID, which has been a big right. change for them. So looking at a $9 billion market cap right now, certainly not what, what was projected in, in the earlier days, but the pandemic accelerated this trend towards more flexible work that's really paying off for WeWork and has been a huge tailwind. What do you see as the prospects for the business from now going forward? Well, it's interesting because COVID, I think, was both a blessing and a curse. You know, they saw their offices completely empty out at the beginning of 2020. Nobody wanted to be in a WeWork. Um, a lot of people may have still had contracts, but nobody was going into the office. You know, I talked to people who described, you know, floors and floors of empty offices, people not really being there. Um, at the same time, now that people are starting to think about going back to the office, there seems to be an advantage for WeWork. They're offering flexible solutions for big companies who aren't sure how much office space to take. You know, maybe in the past you might have known that more clearly. Now that it's unclear how much your employees might want to be in a physical office, something that WeWork's offering looks a little bit more attractive. So that's really the story that WeWork is trying to tell its investors, saying, hey, COVID may have really knocked us down, but it's also going to be the reason that we're going to succeed a lot better than you might have thought before. People are going to be turning to us 
to figure out an uncertain future about the office. All right. Well, it's certainly a new chapter and one without Adam Newman, though I understand he had a big celebration in, in, in the city today. Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt, thank you for uh, helping us chart that journey. Appreciate it. We do have some breaking news now. A panel of CDC advisors has unanimously backed Moderna's booster shot as well as J&J's booster shot for single shot recipients 18 years and up. This is obviously huge news. Of course, Pfizer, uh, the only one that had been backed uh, to that extent until now. Panel of CDC advisors unanimously backing Moderna and Johnson & Johnson boosters. Okay, coming up. My interview with SAP CEO Christian Klein. We're going to talk about whether the company's shift to the cloud has pay off and how it is being impacted by supply chain issues. That is next. And as we head to break, let's take a look at Bumble, Match, and Spotify. All three popular subscription apps rallied after Google announced it is slashing the fees it takes from services like these on the App Store. From January 1st, the Google Play Store will charge third-party subscription apps a 15% commission. Previously, they were charged 30% for the first year, 15% beyond that. The change, however, won't affect most gaming because they use in-app purchases, which are separate from subscriptions. The move comes after pressure from developers and lawmakers. More to come there. This is Bloomberg. Customers hoping to get their hands on the latest Apple products may need to wait a bit longer. Orders for the iPhone 13, iPad mini, 9th generation iPad, Apple Watch Series 7, and MacBook Pro won't be fulfilled until November or even December. Bloomberg is reporting that some Apple Store employees say the supply situation is the bleakest in years. Even so, Apple is expected to break sales records during the final three months of the year. Well, a year ago, SAP shares plunged when the company cut its forecast and announced a dramatic move away from on-premise software to the cloud. So far this year, though, SAP has raised its forecast multiple times and cloud revenue jumped 20% last quarter. SAP CEO Christian Klein joined us from headquarters in Waldorf, Germany, to talk about whether he sees this as a victory or if there's more work to do. We just reported another outstanding quarter, and I guess you can tell the story best when you look at three key metrics. Cloud revenue growth once again significantly accelerated. Now we are up 20% year over year. We just also recorded our highest cloud order entry ever since six years, and then also our cloud, current, current cloud backlog, yeah, which is an important indicator for our future cloud revenue just surpassed 8 billion, also up 22%. So I'm very happy. I mean, there's always, you know, more you can do, but we are clearly ahead of the plan and we just also waste our guidance once again. I remember that day when we spoke a year ago and it was a difficult day for SAP in the markets. Shares had plunged more than 20%. There was a lot of skepticism about that plan. Looking back now, would you have done anything differently? <laughs> Trust me, Emily, I can remember this day also really well. And look, um, for me, it's very important that we follow the needs and requirements of our customers. And especially during the pandemic, what they asked us to do is help us to transform our business model, help us to create more resilient supply chains, and help us to become a more sustainable enterprise. And that's why the shift to the cloud was without any alternative. So that's the one part. And then the second part, with WISE with SAP, we said, also, let's use the power of SAP as we have access to the best practices of over 400,000 customers. And now we are helping our customers more proactively to change their business model, to build resilient supply chains in our business network. And of course, as we are running many factories and, and warehouses around the globe, we are also now managing the green line of our customers. So actually, I, want, I would do it exactly in the same way. And I guess also the success in the last 12 months proved that the strategy is working. You've upped competition with Salesforce and Oracle for sure. And still, you've got Larry Ellison out there continuing to mock SAP's transition to the cloud. What do you have to say to him? And, and what else do you plan to do to increase brand awareness, especially in the United States, where Salesforce and Oracle are more well known? Yeah, a good question. I mean, first of all, yes, uh, of course, I also 
here disclaims around you know ERP market shares back and forth every earnings first of all I take it as a credit yeah when one of our largest competitors talks so much about SAP I see this as a positive sign what I also see is the pure numbers so as for HANA cloud revenue backlog is just up 58 percent Revenue is up 46%. Actually, our core ERP solution is the fastest growing solution in our portfolio. We are not only winning in our install base, we also just closed a quarter where we had over 50% of our customers were net new. So we are winning market share. And every time when I also talk to customers who are not wanting SAP, they come to us because they say, hey, I'm a product company. I want to sell everything as a service. I want to move to pay-as-you-go, subscription license models. This is what SAP can do best, fully automated end-to-end, -end, plus supply chain, plus commerce. And this is why we are winning. And I guess at the end of the day, it's the best to let the customers talk and, of course, you know, to prove it with numbers and figures. You've got a unique view into the supply chain turmoil with your supply chain management software and also into travel with your Concur business. How much more pain will we see in the supply chain and in the travel business and when do things return to normal? That's a good question, Emily. And actually, I mean, you're right. I mean, of course, in the public, we hear a lot about the uh, shortage on the semiconductor side. We also hear about, you know, the container ships who are not can enter the harbor anymore. And there is many more out there where supply chains are heavily disrupted. And what we see with our supply chain software, but even more important with the business network is, that a lot of customers now come to us and said, I want to join this business network. I want to be connected real time with all my suppliers, with all my manufacturers to manage real time the supply chain end to end, not only within my four walls. So yes, the supply chain disruptions are serious. And with some of that, talk, let's talk about semiconductor. I definitely also foresee from what we are seeing is that this will also be the case in the next quarters. So when do you see a return to normal? How far out is that? Yeah, so when, when I look at the travel business, I mean, the good piece is that we actually saw Concur, which is a very good indicator, Concur is back to growth. Yeah, we see, definitely see signs of recovery. People are traveling between Europe and the US, so it's picking up. Of course, not everywhere in the world. What we actually foresee and what we also see in our business is that next year, Q1, Q2, I really hope that we can come more back to normal. The back to normal will not be the level what we have seen before the pandemic, but definitely we see higher activities also in our travel uh, business already now and in the quarters to come. The CEO of SAP there and Tony Fidel, inventor of the iPod, is next. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This week marks 20 years since the introduction of the iPod, the device that kicked off one of the biggest waves of innovation at not just Apple, but in technology history. When the iPod was unveiled, Apple had a $7.7 .7 billion market cap. Now the company is worth two and a half trillion dollars. A lot has happened at Apple in the last two decades, including the death of Steve Jobs and the continued rise of Tim Cook. Who better to talk about it all than the inventor of the iPod himself, Tony Fidel, who of course also founded Next. He's now Nest. He's now a principal at the global investment firm Future Shape, and it's so wonderful to have you in, here in person. Thank you. You Emily. are in town to celebrate the iPod anniversary. Yes. Also the anniversary of Nest. Yep. We'll get to that. When you invented the iPod, where did you think it would lead in your wildest dreams? Did you see a phone and a tablet and a watch and a whole new ecosystem? Uh, absolutely not. Where we were coming off of and where I was coming off of is like 10 years of failure from General Magic and all kinds of personal handheld devices, which were just the only thing that was successful was Palm at the time. So a decade of that. And then, you know, Apple called and said, we have iTunes. What? You know, we want to make an Apple version because we're trying to hook up to MP3 players, right? And so that's how it all came, came about. Now, they've just launched their biggest improvement to the Mac in yeah. years. How good is it? It's and, great. And how does it change the direction for the Mac going forward? I, it's a great question. And if you think about it, the Mac has been basically stuck in whatever Intel could deliver. The Mac kind of worked around it. Now you're going to see incredible innovation. And you've already seen it in just a year from the first Mac um, with an M1, now M1 Pro and M1 Max. 
there's going to be dramatic changes because they can change so many things in the hardware so you can put all kinds of other features on that you've never seen before. So I'm really excited. I've even bought one within minutes after it was announced. Do you buy everything within minutes? Or no. Just that? <laughs> no. And even from Apple, I don't buy everything. Yeah. That one I did. So look, sure. uh, Apple is moving away from Intel chips dramatically and... Done. It's done. done. It's over. For, forever. Permanently. Never going to go back. Not going to go back. What does that mean for a new cycle of innovation? Is so much more possible because that's in-house? Well, if, yeah, absolutely. Because Apple's schedules were dictated when Intel could release those processors. So all the Macs and everything would have to be in lockstep with Intel. The other one was they had to put in hundreds of extra dollars into a Mac for all the margins they had to pay Intel. So when you have to pay Intel $200, $300, $400 per Mac, what does that mean? Now they can take that money and either drop the prices or innovate and put more things into the max. Meantime, this supply chain crunch is impacting everyone, and even Apple. Yep. Even Apple. Absolutely. They might have to slash production of 10 million iPhones that had been planned. Employees, we just reported employees say this is the bleakest they've ever seen in terms of wait times. How bad is this? Well, it's not good. But you have to remember, Apple's been on allocation for all kinds of things over the years. iPod was on allocation for, for two, three years for sales because we couldn't get enough things. But if you look at it, really, Apple has some of the strongest silicon contracts and supply contracts in the world. And so maybe the other ones didn't, you know, other companies trying to get silicon can't get what they need. But a Apple has priority allocation. So if there is silicon to be, to be uh, made, Apple's going to get it because they're pretty strict on how okay. they work with their suppliers. Now, as innovative as Apple has been, there are still those who complain that Apple hasn't innovated <laughs> as much as it did under Steve Jobs. Sure, and I'm curious sure. how you respond to that. Apple is a much bigger place. I still think it's innovating. I don't think just because you want to see a new hardware platform or a new thing, it's, that's not the only place where you innovate. You innovate all kinds of software and services like we're seeing. So that's great. That's wonderful. We'll see new hardware from time to time. Look at the new M1 Max. Those are absolutely innovation. They might not seem like a whole new product category, but it's going to grow market share tremendously for pros and everything else and their margins as well. People want a whole new product category, though. They, they always do. When? And what will it be? Is I it don't know. Be Ask them. AR glasses? A car? Do you think those are things that Apple should be working on that we'll see eventually? It's one person's opinion. <laughs> I think, you know, we've looked at AR stuff for a long time, and it's all down to the display technology for AR. Hopefully Apple has something. I think they might. Um, one of our companies at Future Shape has helped Apple with the, all the mini LED um, displays inside the, the Macs. And then the next one really is about, you know, the car. Well, we've heard about, you know, change of leadership three, four, five times. So. Maybe there's something there, maybe there's not. I think it's a great space to go in, mobility in general. Um, but, we'll, you know, time will tell. What's your expectation for sort of the next chapter of Apple? You know, it's obviously, it's been 10 years since Tim Cook took over as CEO. Great 10 and, years. A, a, and Incredible. 10 more years ahead, maybe. What's going to be the next chapter? I, I think what you're going to see is there's going to just be more software and services on the platforms they have. We'll probably see one more, probably one more big hardware new product category, probably not two. And you'll see a lot more accessories, you know, like you're seeing the AirPods and things of that nature, which are huge product lines. Those are Fortune, those can be Fortune 500 companies in and of themselves. So I, maybe you're not going to see tremendous stuff like an iPod, an iPhone, iPad, all those kinds of things coming. But there's so much more you can build on around the ecosystem of Apple. So I think you've got to really look at software and services as where Apple will be headed. What do you think about the metaverse? Is this where everyone is heading? Should, is that a good thing? I've heard about metaverse <laughs> since in 1988 when we were doing VR glasses back in the day. So I've heard that stuff come up and down and up and down and we see, you know, we see VR happening and then it's not happening. So I'm, I'm still skeptical that it's going to be a big thing. I think it's going to be big in corporate and industrial because there's going to be very specific focused things. But to get that emotional aspect for the consumers and want to be in it all the time, right. that's tough. And if see. it's going to be a big thing, do you think it will be a dystopian thing or a place that we actually will thrive. Look, we didn't want the <laughs> we didn't want the smartphone to become, you know, the refrigerator for all this dystopia that we see with social media. I hope it doesn't happen there as well. We've learned a lot of what the unintended consequences of these devices. So let's just hope that 
you know, this is not going to come with that. Um, we're seeing dystopia a little bit with, you know, self-driving cars that we have to m maintain and monitor. So I think we're going we're gonna to have to be really careful about, as we move forward, thinking about the societal impacts. Do you think that comes down to regulation, or is that choices that executives are making at these companies? Where, you know, who... It's who always to down to the executives. It's always down to the executives. I saw when we were, you know, selecting the types of content we were going to put on the iTunes music store and video store. You know, there was a very clear discussion about, well, why don't we sell porn? Why doesn't Apple sell porn? It's very profitable. People digest it all day long. And Steve got up and said, is this the kind of society we want to live in? Is this what we want to have our kids use as products? And he said, absolutely not. Yes, it can make money, but no, that's not the right thing. So you have to, it goes down to the executive teams and the boards of these companies to make sure they're setting and self-regulating. Because the government is not going to be able to regulate. And so when you see this dystopian world coming from social media, they must regulate themselves. And I don't want to hear this double talk that we're seeing coming out of Facebook and these other companies. Right. It's just... I'm sorry, total How, Do you have confidence in Mark Zuckerberg that, that he'll do that? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to another tech giant, which is Google. You, of course, sold Nest to Google. Yeah. Obviously, you know, they've come out with this new Pixel phone. Um, some people are saying this could be their first real smartphone hit. You think? I hope so. <laughs> they've been trying. They've been trying for years. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, in the Android world, there's a lot of different ways of selling, selling those products, and there's a real tough competition. Um, so maybe it'll work, but it requires more than just hardware. It requires all the services. It requires all the customer support, all the retail, all of those things. And, you know, I just haven't... It takes more than a product. And, a, and the customer journey at Google is mostly software-driven, and it's log-on and, you know, and, and search. So we'll see if they get it right. Given that they bought Nest, what do you think about their decarbonization plans and what Google and, frankly, Apple are doing to try to minimize the impact they have the, on the environment? I think it's, I think it's wonderful. We have, to, we have to do every single thing we possibly can um, around our operations of, of, of companies and how we, how we decarbonize there, but we also have to decarbonize around the products and the supply chain. So when we look at you know, the products, where are, the, what's, where are they being manufactured? Where are those suppliers and that whole supply chain? And are they decarbonizing it? So it's great to have the headquarters do it, but you need the whole chain to do it. And, and I, I hope we're going to hear much more from these large companies about that um, and how they're pushing their suppliers to make sure they're doing more than just you know, labor and, and, and watching those kinds of issues. Amazon just came out with a smart th thermostat. That is a relatively low price point. Sure. You think it's any good? <laughs> I, Honeywell is involved, so I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I love, you don't miss words. Well, okay. I, I have some, uh, you know, a bone to pick with them still. Well, what about the sort of the, the connecting of our homes? You know, they've also, you know, rolled out this indoor flying drone and a home robot. Do we need all that? Is that exciting to you or is that terrifying? I, there's a lot of things you can make. Doesn't mean you should make them. Mm. So I think you have to really look at what you're trying to do. And... To me, less is more, and that was always about Steve. What are you going to say no to? And so if they want to put more things in, you know, they tried microwaves. They've tried all kinds of other clocks with it, all kinds of other things. They need to, I think they need to focus and say, these are the things that really matter. When you do this kind of throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, it doesn't really work from a marketing point of view, and customers don't get locked in. So should Amazon have said no to the robot? No to the ro drone? I don't know enough about the robot. I haven't seen it. The drone, yeah, I'm just like, come on, really? That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, that's interesting given the, you know, drop cam, Nest drop cam. Yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, but it's a flying, it's a, fly, right. it's a flying, it's a flying camera. Maybe it'll be successful. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't tried it. I haven't seen it. Um, we'll see. I don't so, know. So talk to us about your work at, at Future Shape. I know you're really interested in sustainability, and there's yeah. this big question of how will all of these products ultimately be sustainable? Will they be? sustainable what's the what's the big innovation that you're most excited about well for me i'm seeing you know in a lot of cases because we're doing a lot of investment we have 200 uh, companies around the world that we're directly invested in we're taking a lot of technology and bringing it to bear in various developing countries whether that's southeast asia or latin america and helping small and um small businesses medium-sized businesses 
being able to get access to this technology so that they're able to raise themselves up and do it in a sustainable way. So a lot of that stuff we're doing is to try to help these communities and these individual proprietors, not just big businesses. So when we look at stuff, we're looking at aquaculture and agri agriculture and ag tech. We're looking at fintech for these small and medium businesses. Um, we're looking at new materials. Um, all, we're, we're looking across the board, and then we also do the more traditional stuff, which would be bio, synbio, um, drugs, drug platforms. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that we're working on, and um, you know, uh, uh, I'm really excited about one company called Menlo Micro. We, if you remember the trans, uh, the, the transistor, it moved from the vacuum tube to the transistor. We're going to actually replace all of these energy inefficient relays and kinds of things in the RF, 5G world, EV world, mm -hmm. and we have a new micro-mechanical switch that's absolutely as important as the transistor. And, you know, I know you're spending most of your time living outside the United States, and I'm curious with this global perspective on Silicon Valley, what do you see? Is Silicon Valley doing right by the world or not? I think Silicon Valley needs to invest more in these climate Mm -hmm. uh, a change um, directed businesses. We're still seeing too much on buy now, pay later. We're mm -hmm. seeing too much on social. We're seeing, mm -hmm. And where we're investing and where we're finding stuff is not in Silicon Valley for the most part. We're finding it all over the country, all over the US, but we're also finding it in Europe. We're finding it in Southeast Asia, India. So I'm really bullish in seeing that this Industrial Revolution 2.0 is happening and it's happening everywhere. And there's many companies outside of Silicon Valley doing it, because it's not going to just come from Silicon Valley. We need to do it everywhere and make sure it's local for the communities and what they need in those countries. All right, Tony Fidel, congrats on the iPod <laughs> anniversary, 20 years, 10 years since Nest, and um, continuing your work at Future Shape. It's really great to have you here in person. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank Emily. you for stopping by. All right, coming up. NFTs pushing for more representation. We're going to talk about the new minority owned crypto investment firm Metaphor in an exclusive interview next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Let's put the focus on cryptocurrencies and get back to our Kriti Gupta for the market moves in crypto. Take it away. Well, Emily, I decided to go macro to kick off this uh, setup. You really want to look at how Bitcoin is performing relative to the other asset classes, to stocks, to bonds. And right now you're actually seeing stocks outperform bonds once again. And that's really that blue line that you're seeing as shown through ETFs. The white line is Bitcoin. You can really see they're kind of tracking each other. Bitcoin really serving as the sentiment gauge of essentially whether you want to make riskier investments, something that perhaps stocks could also be taking their cue from. I want to show you how uh, the crypto changes this year have actually translated to some of those crypto stocks. So I put together a year-to-date chart here of a uh, Robin Hood, of course, which is exposed to crypto. You've got a exchange, a miner, and then at the end of the day, MicroStrategy, a major investor in Bitcoin. At the end of the day, you can see that it is actually MicroStrategy that's made the most returns, a lot of that coming from that Bitcoin investment. But you also have the miner that's still quite exposed. Robin Hood not really catching up when it comes to that Bitcoin trade, which brings me to yet another way that you can possibly play that big Bitcoin move. And that is, of course, the Bitcoin Futures ETF. Now on its third day of trading, and actually making a round trip to where it started. Two days of gains and one days of losses. Of course, now tracking uh, the Bitcoin futures price in particular, but not making a ton of leeway, at least in the last three days, Emily. All right, Kriti, thanks so much for the roundup. Meantime, a new crypto-focused investment management firm is on a mission to help create more ownership opportunities for minorities in the world of NFTs. Metaphor Fund Management is backed by Andreessen Horowitz, and it's launched a new fund to invest in rare specimens of NFT specifically. Metaphor CEO Brandon Buchanan joins us now from Miami. Brandon, what exactly counts as a rare specimen of NFTs? Sure, sure. Uh, I think rare specimens, uh, at least how we categorize it, are uh, traits that are less than 1% of a collection. Um, you know, that's, that's specifically for what we term as, as you know, PFP projects, uh, which act as like profile pictures or avatars, but there are one of ones that, uh, you know, are obviously super rare. I think 
uh, ones that are are you know older uh, from an OG perspective, I guess it's the terminology in the in you know the crypto sphere. Those categorizers were as well. So, what prompted you to start the fund? What's the end goal here? Oh well, the end goal for this particular vehicle is to acquire the rarest specimen of NFTs, and so I think for us, you know, really we really look at this like. Uh, an era in time where we're shifting from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. So to some degree, um, you know, the assets that we're acquiring have historical significance. So there's some antiquity aspect of it um, that we really like in the acquisition. How do you see this helping artists have more ownership over their creations? Well, again, this, is, this kind of traces back to this idea of Web 2 to Web 3. And you know, using, you know, big tech as an example in Web2, you know, all of our data uh, is really getting harnessed, repackaged and sold, whether it be by Facebook, uh, Google or whoever, who are kind of tracking what we do on the web. And in Web3, we really have this sort of decentralized system um, that allows the creator to actually benefit off of the activity that they're doing on the web. Um, and so from, you know, from that aspect, you know, the value actually goes to the creator, to the participant. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's where the world uh, is shifting. You had a $1.1 million pilot fund earlier this year, and you actually bought, as I understand it, 31 NFTs yourself. What is the goal there? I know you want to raise $100 million. Is it going to work? Yeah, well, the, the, you know, the pilot fund really was designed to really kind of uh, show investors, you know, what the asset class was to begin with, right? I mean, I think for a lot of investors, particularly institutional investors, you know, cryptocurrencies are still regarded as a risky investment. And so when you look at NFTs, um, that's even a subsection of that, right? So um, we really wanted to put something on the table that allowed investors to see what it was we were doing, whether it was investing in NFT related coins, whether it was um, actually buying the NFTs themselves, whether it was minting uh, NFTs, um, so that was that was kind of the goal of the pilot fund. And now when you look at the new vehicle, um, you know, like I said, I think we are we are, you know, in a historical time um, as it relates to the Internet. And so for us, you know, I think the goal is to acquire the rarest specimen of NFTs that exist on the Web. That's certainly um, the ambition. Now, there are thousands of NFT projects. How do you how will you cut through the noise, cut through the hype and rise above the rest? Well, you know, listen, there are your typical heuristics that you would see from any sort of, you know, venture capital fund, whether they're tracking how many Twitter users or folks who are in Discord or what the demand is like when, when there's an actual drop for an NFT. You know, we certainly look at different data points like that. Um, but, you know, really there is a, there's more, I have to say there's more art than science, right? That this is art to some degree and, and, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, so, you know, Thinking back to like sneaker culture or your traditional collectibles or, uh, you know, whether you collected baseball cards or, or Beanie Babies or what have you. I mean, there's there's certainly some aspect of that here. There's something for everybody, which I think is what's so attractive about NFTs as sort of the killer app, if you will, for cryptocurrencies. Right. I mean, it, there is something, um, you know, for for everyone. And once you do start collecting and I think once. You know, groups like Coinbase and FTX who are doing their own marketplaces make it easy uh, for someone to acquire these NFTs and to custody them. I think we'll start to see it pro proliferate even more. All right. Well, we'll keep our eye on you. Metaphor CEO Brandon Buchanan, thank you for joining awesome. us. And we've got plenty more coming up. Before we head to break, let's take a look at Tesla, which closed at a record high. Investors renewing their rush into Tesla shares Thursday after Elon Musk's electric car maker posted its ninth straight quarter of profits. The company reported that gross margins, a key measure of profitability, widened by almost 30 percent in the latest quarter. Investors had already been piling into the stock after Tesla reported blockbuster deliveries for the third quarter. This is Bloomberg. Some other headlines we are following. Volvo says chip shortages and supply chain snarls will continue to cap its truck making, forcing the Swedish manufacturer to turn away some customers. The company says the disruptions and shortages in the production of trucks and in other parts of the group will continue. But Volvo reported a third quarter adjusted operating profit of $1.1 billion, beating the average analyst estimate. 
South Korea successfully launched a home-developed rocket Thursday, the 200-ton liquid-fuel rocket lifting off from the country's southern coast, then released a dummy satellite into orbit. South Korea sees its rocket program as boosting its competitiveness in next-generation 6G communications, while attracting the attention as neighboring North Korea adds to its missile arsenal. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow. We're going to be here for Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger to talk about his company's latest earnings report. Also, Mark Mahaney of Evercore ISI. Always love talking to Mark. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.